Austin Matthews puts on an absolute clinic in the Leafs 3-1 win over the Minnesota Wild. How good do we think this guy is? Well, find out on today's edition of Locked on Leafs. <laughs> Your Locked On Maple Leafs, your daily podcast on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things Leafs. I'm your host, Victor Stefano from TSN 1050 Toronto Radio, also known as Al's Brother, from TSN 1050's Overdrive and Leafs Lunch. With me, I got my co-host Dave Morissuti from Sportsnet and a writer for the NHLPA. And just a reminder that this is a daily Maple Leaf-centric podcast, so be sure to subscribe to the show for free wherever you get your podcasts. So we're now up on YouTube, so check us out, Locked On Leafs on YouTube. YouTube. Dave, how do you like this background that I got rocking here for the folks watching on YouTube? I figured that you taught me how to use virtual backgrounds because I am so oblivious to all of this stuff, (laughs) all this type of technology and stuff, as Robert Gronkowski likes to call it. And uh, I thought, "Eh, let's put this behind a little bit of a locked on lease background for us. So if you like it, give us a thumbs up on YouTube. Gotta bring, uh, the brand though. bring the brand and, and we're helping the brand. That's right. For the brand locked on lease. Let's go. And uh, you talk about for the brand and, and, and brand for the Maple Leafs boy, Austin Matthews. Did he ever do the brand proper tonight? He was spectacular. Like Dave, I, I, I this might've been the greatest game that he has played in the NHL. It was a full 200 foot. Look at that thing. Look at that thing that you're showing me right now. This is the Tim Hortons, Austin Matthews, locker stick uh, he's opening up the locker right there and, and and that is just a thing of beauty maybe we'll have to give one away because i think i might have an extra one here actually we can do a giveaway if we can get 500 subscribers on youtube i'm going to give away my austin matthews tim hortons collectible stick these, so things, these are big collector items now i know i got a couple of them to be quite honest with you so i think i can part with one if we can bump up those numbers on youtube i think we we're up over 100 so if we can get to 500 We'll give one away. So go follow us on uh, on YouTube. But let's show this man some love, all right? Show this man some absolute love. The 200-foot game, the 200-foot nature of this guy's game tonight was, was something else, man. Like, this is the type of performance where he may become the front runner for the Hart Trophy. Like, do you think I'm out of line? Am no, I out of line here? Not at all. Like, he, they give up the first goal, shrugs it off, says, okay, I got you guys. Score a goal. Second Dude. goal. 30 His, seconds later. Yeah. <laughs> He's unfazed. No emotion either. Just all business. The second goal. Oh, I think the guy on the wild needs to retire after that. The guy he <sighs> pulled the puck off of. He's like 16 games into his NHL career, to be on it. To be fair, he's a rookie in the league, and it was just not very nice of Austin Matthews to end a man's career so quickly. But like that play was just exceptional. And if you missed the game, go make sure that you go and you watch that goal. And, and you know, this was the goal for him to not only, um, you know, win the game, it was the eventual game winner, but also take the lead in the scoring race. He's now atop of the rocket race, which imagine that back in October when he was like 9, 10, 11 goals back, a dry side on a veg game. You're like, ah, oh, I really expected him to be part of the, the rocket race. Pfft. Man, out of nowhere, this guy ends up being in it. And now he's finally in the lead. But this play itself was just phenomenal. It ends up the puck ends up into the neutral zone. And he just gets on his high horse, chases it down, lifts Duhame's stick, says, Thank you, I'll take that. Turns back up ice with him and Marner, and away they go on a two on one, and then just a, blows past his man and has an easy tap in as Marner sauces it over to Austin Matthews. That turns out to be the game winner tonight. 3 uh, 1 was the final over the wild, but that was just such an amazing play. And you know, when you talk about, you know, the Hart Trophy and, and why I think that this was a type of night where you just toss on the tape and you you can literally make your case just by a bunch of clips and plays that was made tonight. Not only just his goals, but his his battles along the boards, his battles in the corners, his, his uh, just his stick just always around. He had six takeaways tonight. Six takeaways. Like, that's incredible for a guy who's known as the best goal scorer in the league to have six takeaways as well. Had a hit, a block for good measure. He was 17-2 and in the faceoff dot, Dave. 
17 and 2 in the faceoff dot. He was phenomenal tonight. And Jeff O'Neill said this after the broadcast. He said Austin Matthews is the best player in the game right now. The best player in the game right now. That includes one Mr. Connor McDavid. Can you get behind that at this point? I mean, it's one thing to say that he's a Hart Trophy winner, but can we actually make that argument that maybe he actually is better than Connor McDavid and he is the best player in the game? You know what? I've heard this conversation for the last little bit. Oh, shout out to Adam Wilde, who also had the same take about a week and a half, about a week ago on his podcast. Yeah. Like, we're not just taught, it's not just the goal scoring ability of Austin Matthews. As you mentioned there, the guy is probably one of the more complete players in terms of best goal scorer in the league. He's doing it defensively, you know, in the draws with the takeaways. He doesn't take many penalties, so it's not like he's costing his team anything. And you know what? He's he's he, usually we always say that Austin Matthews is kind of one sided in terms of his production work. Sometimes he, people say he's just a goal scorer. He's added a bit more. He's you know it's, there's a bit more of a balance in terms of the goals and the assists this season as well. Like yeah, there isn't there aren't many areas in the game that Austin Matthews isn't you know impacting for the least. Five game winning goals I think this year would actually make it six. I don't think that's even been updated from tonight. Like I when like when Connor McDavid would win it. It was because the Edmonton Oilers need a Connor McDavid so badly. Like without McDavid, we don't know what the Oilers are. This season, like imagine if Austin Matthews wasn't performing like he is, the Leafs would not be in the position I think they are right now. I think you can easily say that. Well, you take it tonight's game for example. I mean, that was just a, a totally boring snooze fest through the first uh, 25, 30 minutes of that hockey game. Like there really was nothing going on. And then all of a sudden he takes over and he says, all right, let's get this thing going. They get scored on. And then he said, all right, let's go. Goes down the wing, just, you know, gets a puck from Lilligren, skates right through the neutral zone, skates right past Ryan Hartman and rips it right under the bar. And then from then on out, it was like he was on it. Then Toronto started to really pick things up a little bit. You saw a little bit more, uh, you know, offense come from them. And then in the third period is really where you saw them take advantage and kind of take control a little bit more tonight. And that was all, you know, Austin Matthews just putting the team on his back and, and dragging that team into the fight. Uh, he really was just incredible tonight. Peter Morazic too, a, a good bounce back performance out of him. He got the start tonight after, Jack Campbell, you know, got the last couple and a couple of stinkers, you know. So eventually they had to go to the other goaltender. And Peter Mrazek, it was his chance to reclaim the net possibly. And he does. And and pretty good, pretty good outing for him. What did he stop? 29 at 30 tonight? Yeah, 29 at 30. And pretty good night, I thought, for him. But the question now I have for, for Mrazek is, you know, do you go back to him in Detroit on Saturday? I think you do. Yeah, no, I, I you know, and I, I kind of at the end of the game, I, I like listen to what Jim Ralph has to say too, as you know, a guy who used to be in the net and how goalies sort of thing. He said that just based on the performance alone, Morazic should get the next start. And like you, you, you gotta go, you gotta reward the guy for a performance like that. You know, this was, not, this was, as you said, this was a snooze fest of a game. Like I was contemplating getting an espresso halfway <laughs> through. Like that's. That's like, I'm just like, there was what, like 10 shots in the first period combined? 11, like, yeah, it was six to five. Yeah. So at least took 10 minutes to get their first shot on net. And it was, I don't even think it was an actual shot. It was the Michael Bunting, which technically went off the side of the net, went off the post, I think. Yeah. But they that credited shot. it as a shot. The, the that guy, was the third shot on goal. Literally, the guy who's like trying to keep track of the shots was just like waiting, waiting, waiting. He's like, I can't wait anymore. It's like he had to, he had to do it. Yeah, he's like, here, just give it to him a shot. But, like, this is the type of game that the Leafs have needed from their goaltenders where it's not a busy night for them. So it's like if they're going to get beat, it's most likely going to be a bit of a stinker or, like, with so many, like, they weren't giving up many chances either. And let's not forget also they had four penalties. Like, they had, they were shorthanded four times yeah. in that game. I think it was four. Like, I probably should have double checked. I'm, no, I'm just looking at three four seconds. For four the power play. Yeah, four. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was four for four. Like, though, like 
you know, Mrazek had to be sharp. Like that, even though there weren't a lot of shots, that means just the ch- every chance was so crucial in a tight game like that. This is, I think, a performance the Leafs really needed from him. Well, here's the thing, because the type of goal thing that they've gotten recently, there seemed to be at least one goal a game that had been backbreaking. One where each whoever was in net, whether it was Morazic or as Campbell, where at the end of the game, you're like, you want that one back. And it typically kind of was one of those goals at, at a moment in the game where it tilts the ice a little bit. You didn't have that tonight. He didn't allow that backbreaking goal. The one that 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 went through was just a, a nice, well played shot by by uh, by Goudreau. You know, standing at the side of the net, it was just a good play by Boldy down low, get it up top, and just a quick shot, and, and it ends up beating the goaltender. That's gonna happen, you know. But he was he made every save he had to make, which I think is something again, that has been lacking from the, the least tandem as of late. And then there was a couple of stops, you know, later in the game. I, uh, I, I wrote this down in my notes, one that I thought was a timely save, which was big. Uh, let me just find it where I put it here. Oh yeah. It, it, it was, there was about four or five minutes left in the game or so. The Leafs were up two one and Nick Felino had a good opportunity. And then, uh, he gives up a bad rebound, but made sure that he did get the stop off the rebound with Felino pouncing in on it. So that you, you would be Marcus already. Felino, by the way. I do, yeah. just don't want to give Leafs fans PTSD with Nick Felino. You mean Marcus? Did I say Nick? Yes, you do. Okay, Marcus, Marcus Felino. Absolutely, okay. Marcus Felino. Um, but no, I, you know, Peter Mrazek, I thought I had a. Had a good bounce back performance. Matthews clearly was the was the stud. Uh, what else? Anything else stick out to you today? The penalty kill, obviously, but anything yeah, else that stuck out? I mean, just in a game like that, the Leafs they stayed committed to their defensive yeah. play. They didn't waver from it. They weren't trying to cheat too much to try to create offense and you know get stuck with a brutal turnover that led to a goal. Like that didn't happen. Um, also, yeah, we, we talked to, we did it again, Mike, you know, Matt Boldy score gets a point. We said, watch out for this guy. He's going to do something. He didn't, the Leafs didn't lose the game. So that, that ends that trend, but he still got a point. We're, we're just, we're just giving a lot of guys, uh, some real, uh, pump ups (laughs) from the other team. I know, I know, I know. If only we could do that with with the Maple Leafs, with our own players. John Tavares, this guy's going to be dangerous on Saturday. He's going to be dangerous. You wait. You wait. You watch. You see Leafs Nation. It's going to happen. We'll see if we can. We'll we'll manifest. we got to manifest a little bit. Can we manifest it like we've been doing for the last three games? I hope so. Let's hope so. Man, I was so upset that when they had John Tavares out out on the ice with the net empty, I'm like, the mission for the Maple Leafs right now, first and foremost, don't allow a goal. But if you do get a crack at the empty net, give it to John Tavares. Let that man score and just let him get it into the back of the net. I had uh, I had Rick Tockett on my show on Leafs Lunch yesterday, and we asked him, when your players are in a slump as a coach, how do you try and get them out of that? And one of the things he said was, what I like to do is is I like to put them out there if there's an empty net because if they can get that empty net goal, sometimes that's enough to get the monkey off the back and they just see that puck go into the net and it's just a sigh of relief and then they can really get going and go in a heater from there. And I thought I saw Tavares out there. I'm like, all right, this is it. This is a chance for the least to get it. And then Alex Kerfoot goes and gets the goal. And it's like, Kerf, come on, man. Just turn around and, and, and see if you can find – you know, Tavares, your captain trailing, you get him the puck, you silly goofball. But anyways, they still won the game. So I guess uh, we'll have to wait one more game and, and watch Tavares tear it up against uh, the Detroit Red Wings. All right, let's take a quick break here when we get back. I actually have a theory on on how I think the Maple Leafs are best. Like when they have success, and maybe how I think they should be playing the rest of the season. I'll explain that when we return. We'll go through our three stars. And then uh, also some more comments here from the insiders. Darren Dreger insinuating it may not be an all-in effort for the Maple Leafs at the deadline. I don't know how I feel about that. Curious to get your thoughts on that as well. And before we do get to all of that, why don't we hear a word from today's show sponsor, Dave? Well, I hope all the Leafs guys got some Bilt Bars after the game. Because, you know, Bilt Bars, not only are they delicious, 
you know, for, for athletes, they're quite healthy too. 130 calories, four grams of sugar, four net carbs, 17 grams of protein. I think, uh, I think that's a nice little tasty treat after victory. You know, they got many flavors to choose from, you know, mint brownie, coconut, coconut almond, and new for this month, white chocolate cookies and cream. They are all delicious and new flavors coming out all the time. If they think a flavor might be good, they'll make it. It will be delicious and it'll be good for you. So make sure you go to built.com, use the promo code LOCK15 and get 15% off your order. Remember, that's LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. Welcome back into the Locked On These Podcast. I'm Mike DiStefano, host of the show, alongside my co-host Dave Morissuti. And just a reminder, this is a daily Maple Leafs podcast. You can find it wherever you get your podcast from uh, for the audio version. You can also find the video version on YouTube now. And uh, when we get to 500 subs, we'll be doing a giveaway. So you'll make sure you'll want to be a subscriber, and you can go do that at uh, on YouTube at Locked On Leafs. Uh, before we before we took a break, I kind of hinted at, at a style of game that I think works best for the Maple Leafs. And it's not the run-and-gun, offensive, gung-ho style that we kind of expect them and want them to play. Sometimes it's this simple, low-event hockey games where the Maple Leafs typically come out on top. Remember early in the year when they were winning games 2-1, 3-2, you know, they're really one goal games, low scoring games, low event games, and they were winning a whole lot. And then they kind of got away from that. It started giving up more chances, but they also started scoring more, and it just became a lot more high event. Maybe this is what the Leafs needed. Get back to that low event style of hockey, focus on playing defensively, and then trust that one of your studs, your stars like a Matthews or a Marner or a Neil or a Tavares, will break the game open at some point with a dynamic play, a dynamic goal, and then you just hope that they get two or three plays a game and you win the game 3-1, 3-2. I think that is the going to be the, the best. That might be the recipe for success here for, for this Maple Leafs team, especially now with this injury to Muzzin. Buy in defensively and then hope for your superstars to make a superstar-esque play at some point to get that offense. And I think it's it's a it's a matter of balance, right? You can't, as you said, you can't be all in on the attack because we have seen the Leafs get burned by odd man rushes because they're getting a little too aggressive. Well, how often effort. have we? How often were we seeing in the games against Montreal and 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 against St. Louis where we had defensemen? I mean, Morgan Riley does this so much, and and I don't mind. I I don't mind it. Again, it's it's a more fun brand of hockey to watch where these defensemen will jump up into the rush. For some reason, Ilya Labushkin has been jumping up into the rush since he got to Toronto. But anyways, besides that... He's free, you know, Mike. He's free. He's free, I guess. He's he's away from, uh, from the desert. But, you know, so often we see that happen, and then they kind of get caught, and then it's a two-on-one the other way. And, and that's where things start to go awry for Toronto. But on nights like tonight, where you don't see as much jumping up into the rush by the defenseman. They kind of hang back, and they don't allow you. They stay on top of pucks, and, and they really clog up the neutral zone because they're in good position because they're not caught up ice. Things tend to go a little bit better for Toronto. Yeah, like, you know, when they're really dialed in defensively, you can see then they get the confidence to know when they can make that push offensively, right? And they don't need much, right? This is a team that doesn't need to really force things offensively. I think it really also comes down to their play in the neutral zone. You saw what Matthews did where Minnesota gets over their blue line. It didn't take him long to hunt down that puck and take yeah. it the other way, right? I think it's really going to be the neutral zone that it's going to be the focus of the defensive play because if they can slow down the opposing team, it'll be a lot better for their defensemen to not have to, you know, defend odd man rushes. I agree with you totally that the pinching of the defenseman really needs to be more calculated. At times, it just feels like it's a little more freelance where it's like, all right, like there's an opening here. I'm going to go for it, but maybe not accounting for the counterattack. And that's, I think that's been like their biggest problem is not accounting for who's on the ice, what the situation is. I think it's more situational awareness that can really get them Right. And, and this is where when you listen to Sheldon Keefe and you listen to these guys talk, they talk about being connected. So if you are going to pinch, 
as long as the forward is supporting, you're okay with that, right? If you're pinching, if you're Morgan Riley and you're going, or you're Travis Dermott or you're Rasmus Sandin and you're pinching down the half wall, as long as whoever is on that wing kind of cycles back up top to the point to cover you, I don't have a problem with that. But sometimes when this team and this, they, they try and, you know, they get really aggressive offensively. Now you're sitting there with only one blue liner back there. And if you, you know, make a mistake on your pinch, like we saw happen with, with Morgan Riley on, was it the Montreal game on the the Cole Caulfield goal? That's exactly what happened essentially, right? Went to go make a play and he got, you know, fumbled the puck and went over him and boom, two on one the other way. So yeah, I, 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 I'll be curious to see if this is the style of game that they try and stick to for a little bit and, and maybe they'll find some more success. And, you know, the, the old saying goes, um, defense wins championships, and and so often you hear coaches say Mike Babcock was a massive proponent of this. You know, through good defense will come offense. So, and that's kind of what we saw happen tonight with Austin Matthews, right? Good defense by going hunting down that puck and and, and getting the puck back, getting a takeaway for his club, and then the other way they went and ended up scoring the game winning goal. So I, I I I wouldn't be shocked if maybe we see a little bit more snooze worthy low event games here out of Toronto, but Hey, if they can keep putting up two points, keep winning hockey games, and then just show us one or two highlight real plays throughout the game. You know what? Two points is two points. I guess we'll take that too. You know I, what I, mean? I think also it comes down to in the offensive home being a little more patient, right? You know, they're, they're such a good team with the cycle and on the four check that sometimes they don't give themselves enough credit that they can hold the puck a little bit long in the offensive zone, give the guys chances to get set, and keep the keep the opposing team in their own zone longer. It's going to wear them down, and it's only going to help later in the game when you're trying to really press for more offense. Yeah. Uh, let's really quickly get through our three stars of the game. Um, I'll, I'll bang out my three. Give me your three. You let me know if there's any difference here. Um, but I gave Mitch Marner my third star of the game. He had a couple of assists tonight, and and he was kind of all over the place with with Austin Matthews. They were, you know, they were they were honestly the two best forwards out there on the ice. I thought uh, ended up with three takeaways as well. So Mitch Marner I gave the third star. Peter Morazic gave him the second star. Um, able to make twenty nine of thirty stops. Went five for five in high danger save, uh, high danger saves, which. It's something that they have really, really lacked. Both Mrazek and Campbell, second and third worst high danger save percentage since December 1st. So to have a perfect night where you go five for five, that's a positive in my books. Um, And then I already talked about kind of that timely stop on Marcus Foligno, not Nick, but Marcus Foligno to preserve that 2-1 lead and make sure that they they walked away with the victory. So I gave Peter Mrazek the second star. And then, uh, to no one's surprise, Austin Matthews, my Hart Trophy front runner at this point in the season, walking away with first star honors. Yeah, mine are pretty much the same. I just wanted to give a special shout out. TJ Brody led the Leafs in shorthanded time tonight at 503. You don't want to know who was second? Kasha. Timothy Liljegren. Yeah, like, that makes sense. I mean, without Jake Muzzin, someone's got to step up there, and 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 Lilligren's the guy, I guess, who uh, who's going to get those duties. I wanted yeah. to give him a special shout for that reason. That we were always concerned of whether he could play in those situations. He was out there late in the game when the Leafs trying to hold the lead. I I don't have him as a star, but I think he deserves a shout out because you, you and I pretty much have the same order for the stars tonight. Yeah, I mean, if you look at just look at the shot share too uh, with them on the third pair, Dermot and Lilligren, they actually were the best on the team with a 65% shot share between the two of them at five on five. And if you also take a peek at the expected goal numbers, also Dermot 67% uh, and what was Lilligren 55% expected goals for. And considering that the Maple Leafs were outshot tonight, I think that's a positive as well. You know, the third pair kind of got it done. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. Let's give a little, little honorable mention to uh, Timothy Lilligren. I mean, Rasmus Sandin too had a, had a good game offensively. I thought that he had a few really good looks there, um, to and almost scored uh, on on two opportunities. I thought 
from the blue line. All right, we'll take one more quick break. When we get back, we'll re we'll, we'll get back into these Darren Drager comments and whether or not you would feel comfortable with the Leafs not being as aggressive as we initially thought at the deadline. So that's what we got uh, cooking here on the Locked on Leafs podcast. But before we get to all that, why don't we hear from one of today's show sponsors. It's one of our favorite sponsors that we got here. It's betonline.net. Football might be over this season, but basketball is in full steam for both pro and college hoops. From all the latest odds, totals, player performance props to where the next fire coach is going to land, BetOnline.net is the number one spot for all your sports betting needs. BetOnline remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline.net is your source for hockey, boxing, UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. You can head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. BetOnline, it's where the game starts. And uh, Dave, I'll be honest, I thought this was going to be more of a high-scoring affair in this game. I was all over the over six and a half. That was not how today's game went. That is for sure. A little short on that one. A little bit short. A little bit short on that one, unfortunately. But hey, you know, you win some, you lose some. I did place a wager on Austin Matthews to score, and he did that twice. So, you know. It's you're going to win some, you're going to lose some. Um, not sure if you heard these comments. It was in the pregame tonight. Darren Dreger, someone insinuating that the Leafs aren't necessarily as all in as we initially thought them to be or figured them to be. Uh, he says they pretty much don't plan on moving their first round pick or top prospects for a rental. Um, I did also see some reports out there that. There was a deal in play. Oh, this was a more blogger type stuff, so who knows if it's even true. But apparently there was some sort of deal in place. Um, Dallas made an offer for John Klingberg, and it included a first-round pick, and Toronto was not willing to give up that first-rounder. So it seems like they're not interested in giving up first-round picks or top prospects for rentals. Uh, how do you feel about that? Does, does that make you feel good, feel bad? Does that mean that you're probably thinking the deadline might go a little bit more differently if this in fact is the case what's your thoughts here well it's it's interesting because i mean when we think back to kyle dubas talking a few weeks ago about how many you know how many bullets they have in the chamber it kind of made me think okay maybe they're they're really thinking about how they want to allocate the resources but the market price is going to be what the market price is, right? If the Leafs don't want to give up a first for John Klingberg, guarantee there's probably a team that is will be willing to do it. It's not yeah, like man. that means they're not going to get John Klingberg. <laughs> like exactly, that's what right? That means. So I can understand if they want to hold off on the big package to get somebody that has some term with it with him. I can get that part. Like if that's what they're focused on, fine. The whole idea of the rental, I guess maybe because the last few years you went out and you went to get a rental and it didn't work out. And so they're trying to really hone in on something that's going to provide them with a little bit more value on the return. I can get that. But yeah, you have to really weigh in the fact that if you don't go and get a John Klingberg and let's say Boston or I don't know if even Tampa can do it or like one of those teams does it. And then you get burned by one of those guys in the playoffs. It's a bad look <laughs> regardless because you're trying to save your assets for the right moves. And then the ones you didn't make end up being the one that hurt you. Yeah. I mean, Florida is reportedly in the market for a top four defenseman, you know, like there, there's very similar needs with, with Florida and Toronto in that regard. And if they end up paying the Piper and, and, and paying the, the expensive price to bring in a player, cause they want to go as far as they can. They think they have a good opportunity. I, I think they'll do it. And if Toronto's not willing to, I, I just don't know why. Like the way that I look at this for if I'm Kyle Dubas and, and you know, perhaps he has more assurance behind closed doors that, you know, maybe his job is not in jeopardy if it's a first round loss again this year. But I mean, there's a good possibility that his job could be in jeopardy if they are out in the first round again. So in my estimation, 
why wouldn't you go all out to make sure that you went around? Remember when Columbus did this a couple of years ago? Like this was a team who had never, ever won a round in their history. And they went out and they went and they got, uh, well, they, who did they go out and sign? They, they had, sign it. yeah, right. So they went, they got Duchesne. They, they got went Zingle. To- Zingle, and then they made one other decent. They kept Panarin and Bobrovsky. Like those were considered their own that, rental. That's what it was. That's what it was. So they had an opportunity to move them for at the deadline, but they kept them and then added to that. And it was people were saying, "Wow, well, that's kind of silly. You're going to allow these guys walk, plus you're giving up these picks. Hey, this team's going to be in in peril for years to come." But to them, they needed to get out of the first round. They needed that to happen for their fan base. So it was worth it to them just to, to win that round. It was worth it. Um, and they ended up recouping a decent amount of picks and prospects this past season when they ended up trading away uh, at Seth Jones. But, you know, I wonder if if Toronto, I, I think they should be in the same boat where it's we got to win around here and we got to put our, ourselves in the best position to do that. And if that means giving up a first round pick for Klingberg or Ben Sherratt or Josh Manson, over, you know, maybe you can keep your first and it would only take a second to get a Justin Braun. I mean, that's a swing and a miss to me. I'd rather give up more capital and give this team a better opportunity than worry about the future. I guess I'm, I'm at the point where I'm willing to risk and mortgage the future to make sure that this team has the best opportunity to win in the present. I think it's also just what are you going to give up that first round pick for? Like, I think it's just they, they're being a little more selective than what many are thinking. But yeah, I totally get that because what's that first round pick's value if you do well in the regular season, but then you don't go far in the playoffs? That first round pick isn't going to really be, you can get a decent player in the first round. Like, you know, look at what Rasmus Sandin has turned into. Yeah. But it's not going to be, you're not, you're not going to be in a position where you're giving up you know, a top 10 pick. Like, I think that's something that needs to be weighed a little bit more. And I think people, I think first round picks can be hit and miss when they're lower. And you see how the Leafs have done in the second round and guys, they've gotten in those rounds. Like you have to kind of weigh the the value of that pick of what you think you can get versus what you're trying to achieve. So what it sounds like also, and, and Here's the thing. I, I wonder, uh, and I'm just thinking this through right now, but what if the Labushkin deal was just a little bit of a, an appetizer, a, just, just mm-hmm. buttering up Arizona to try and swing a deal to bring in a Jacob Chikrin? Because with Jake Muzzin out, presumably long-term, now that he's on LTIR, you know, there's two spots in that top four that they need, and now all of a sudden there is a need on the left side as well, unless you feel that Sandine could do it full time, which I, I think that remains to be seen. First of all, I don't even think that they make a deal for another few weeks. I think they want to get a good look at what Sandine can do before making a, a decision here, but also because they may end up bringing Muzzin back. It might be a moot point anyway as well. But anyway, I I, I wonder if now Chikrin becomes more of a viable option, and that's where you feel like you can give up your, your picks and prospects to get a guy like that. Yeah, like if I'm giving up a first round pick and you're bringing in a guy that's got term, he's you know not you know old, an older player as well. Like he's you know he can he's, he's like twenty three, isn't he? Twenty three years yeah. old. Like he's not even at his prime yet. No, he's nowhere near his prime. At least I mean, I I I think that's a deal where you don't care about that first round pick because you're getting a Jacob Chikorin, right? Yeah, you're right. giving up. A, you know this was this was a guy that was a high pick. He was a top 20 pick mid round, mid first round. Like this isn't a guy that I've heard the name, like, you know, haggle from, from the Blackhawks. Are you going to give up a first for a guy that like, like, like that type of deal doesn't make sense. But if you're going a pick and a little bit more to get a guy like Chikrin, at least this is an established player. He fits a need now and going forward. And if you have to move away from a guy that hasn't established himself, you know, maybe Arizona's trying to get Erasmus Sandin or Timothy Lilligan return. You have to weigh the. I know they 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 would like to see what they have in Erasmus Sandin, but you already know what Chikrin is, and there's probably a lot more he can provide in terms of upside. Yeah, it's it's going to be a fun three weeks here before the trade deadline coming up on March 21st. It'll be three weeks on Monday. 
And uh, Monday, I guess, will be the next time that we chat with you guys. I guess before we go, really quickly, Leafs in Detroit tomorrow night. Are we on team start Peter Morazic? I think you have to. I, I think he's or, like he's not going with Peter Morazic, I think doesn't set the right precedent either. Like Jack Campbell almost has to win back the net. And that will come when Peter Morazic gives up the net. I I also think um I was having a conversation with uh, with Craig Button today as well, and he said something that was really interesting to me. And sometimes goaltenders, their best time to find their game isn't in game. It's in practice. It's by watching film and practicing with their goalie coaches. I wonder if you if you tell Jack, hey, we're going to give Peter a run of, you know, three, four games here. You don't got to worry about it. Just go and make sure that you have good hard practices. You know, find your angles again. Find your, you know, rest up if if you if that's what you also need. If fatigue starting to set in, and then maybe if he comes back and you know what I mean. Like I'm I'm trying to explain it here, but perhaps you give Mrazek a bit of a run, and then that gives Campbell a chance to a practice his craft, which is something he hasn't been able to do a whole lot because he's been playing a lot this season. Gives him a little bit of a rest since he has never played this much hockey in a season in his career, mm-hmm. and maybe even a mental rest. You know, yeah. like the, there's just the fact that you're in game, and often goaltenders will say it's not so much the physical, you know, being physically tired. It's a, it's it's a big mental drain playing the goaltending position in the NHL. So maybe three, four games, you you take it off, you see what Mrazic can do. And then you kind of get back in there and hopefully you can regain your form that you had. I'm not even talking November. You know, we, we don't even need him to be a 940 goaltender. But if he could be league average or slightly above league average, I think this team has a much better shot at making a deep run here at the playoffs. That's my estimation on that. So, you know, a, a good performance by Mrazic in, in Minnesota. I think he earned another start anyways but it also works in the favor of Jack Campbell to get him a couple of days off, a couple of days rest and allow him to practice a little bit here. But we're not coach Sheldon Keefe and uh, we're not Steve Breer. We're not making those decisions. That'll be up to them. Did you have another comment there? No, I no, I think you're, you're totally right. I think the rest part, I think is an underrated part. You see Jack Campbell on the bench and he kind of gets a chance to, to see the game rather than, from a different perspective and get a little bit of light. You know, he, I think he caught a puck and kind of saw a smile from him. Like just give him a chance to enjoy the game maybe a little bit. Cause you know, when you're struggling, you're not enjoying the game. And that yeah. I think also impacts your mental ability as well. And uh, we're going to, we're going to also just say that John Tavares, watch out for that guy, Detroit. He's going to be a handful for the Red Wings, uh, an absolute handful. Let's hope that we can will that one into existence like we've done with everybody else seemingly over the last little bit here on the podcast. All right, that's going to do it for us here today on the show. I'd like to thank you all for listening and supporting the podcast. You can subscribe to it, uh, the Lockdown Leafs podcast, on all podcasts and platforms and receive daily Leafs content. Follow myself on Twitter at Mickey underscore Canuck. Follow Dave at D underscore Morissuti. And follow the show at Lockdown Leafs. And once again, you can also follow us now on YouTube. That's uh, Locked on Leafs on YouTube. We'll be back with another episode on Monday to break down the weekend. But until then, keep it locked right here on Locked on Leafs.